All right, we're going to continue our study today in, in the, the Gospels as we're going chronologically through them. Uh, today is part nine, believe it or not. We're moving through these things, and uh, we're on John chapter two is where we'll be starting at this morning. John chapter two. Now, last week we saw Jesus calling his first disciples. That's one of the things we talked about. Uh, we saw Andrew and John, who were initially the followers of John the Baptist. Uh, but once they saw Jesus and Jesus called them, he, they followed him. And one thing we pointed out also last week is that John the Baptist didn't try to go after him, did he? Right? He saw his disciples following Jesus and he didn't try to grab them by the coat or you know, say, hey, get back here. This is, you, you're going over here. You're supposed to be listening to me. Right? And we pointed that out last week that sometimes Jesus, or sometimes the Lord will call people to different places. And we don't ever always understand why the Lord does what he does. Right? I, I learned one thing in the past that, that if somebody said that they were wanting to do something, and I might try to give them advice, but as soon as I heard the words, they, they thought that, that God wanted them to do it, I just let it go. Fine, that's it. I'm not going to be the one to get in the way of what God wants to do. Uh, so that's what we see with uh, uh, Andrew and John. And we also see John the Baptist, or uh, excuse me, um, they went and we also saw uh, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel also following Jesus at this time. Um, so this week we, we continue on our study here in John chapter 2. Jesus is about 30 years old at this point, right? He, his ministry on earth was only about three to three and a half years. So Jesus is about 30 years old at this point, and he's got his first disciples with him, and today we're going to look at him performing his first miracle, right? His, Jesus' first miracle. Before we go any further, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I pray that you'll bless your word this morning. Father, I pray that you'll just speak to our hearts in a special way. Lord, give us understanding that we uh, help us see things we might not normally see, Lord, as we look through this. And uh, we love you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll start off here in, in John 2, and, and we'll be in uh, verse number 1. And the Bible says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, this third day, this could either be directly continuing Right after Jesus called Nathaniel, this could be like, I mean, right after that. Or we could be talking about three days from the time that Jesus called Nathaniel. But either way, it's, it's very soon, right after uh, chapter 1. Verse 2 says, uh, Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, They have no wine. Now this is a major, who, who here has ever been to a party or a get-together, right? And you've got your finger foods out there, and, and you've got your soda and your Kool-Aid, or whatever you've got there at your party and all of a sudden something runs out, right? For the host, that's like a nightmare. They don't ever want to run out of stuff. And uh, for me, it's kind of the same way. I, if, we, if we're having to get together at the house or, or we're having uh, fellowship over here at the hall and uh, somebody asked me, said, how much food do you think we should get? My, my first answer is always, well, we don't want to run out. That's the last thing you want to happen, right? I don't know why it's so embarrassing, uh, at least for me, maybe. I don't know for y'all, but you just don't want to run out of stuff. Right and here we have a big get-together, we have a wedding, and a wedding is also a very big deal at this time because it's something uh, that in this day and age that the groom would prepare for almost a year ahead of time. Uh, during this time, also, uh, when, whenever there was an engagement, right, there was, um, uh, there was about a year time that would go between the, excuse me, the engagement was when the agreement to get married, the betrothal was about the year time that they would wait between the engagement and when the groom, right, not, not the wife, when the groom would actually be prepared enough to, start to get the wedding going, right? So what would happen is the, the, the husband or the family, they would get together and they would agree, uh, yes, you know, our, our children are good for each other. They're going to get married. That's kind of how the engagement worked. The betrothal was when the, when the kids were old enough to realize what was going on and they said, okay, yeah, we're going to continue this on. We're going to carry this engagement through. And that's when the betrothal started. But that was also a time when, when the wife or the, the bride-to-be would go home and she didn't know when the wedding date was. How, how, how stressful would that be for the ladies, right? They, she wouldn't know when it was going to happen. But it was on the groom to take that year to go save up his money and get everything together to where the, the marriage would actually start, right? So, that, so for him to plan a wedding out and then to run out of wine was, hey, they'd look at the groom and say, hey, man, you, your planning's messed up. You know, you, you messed up. So they ran out of wine, and, and Jesus' mother, Mary, she said, hey, Jesus, we have no wine. You know, what are we going to do? Right, and here we see a point amongst many Christians, and I'm just going to go ahead and bring it out because I've heard so many different, I've read so many different things, and uh, this wasn't actually alcoholic wine. All right, my, some of y'all might laugh at this argument. I kind of laugh at it sometimes. 
This is what kind of wine was this? Is it alcoholic or was this grape juice? Goodness sakes, I've heard that ever since I was a little kid. I've heard that argument back and forth, and uh, goodness sakes. Well, what was it? Was it wine or grape juice? Well, I'm a black and white kind of guy, all right? Black and white. If the Bible says it's wine, I'll just take it. It's wine, all right? There's not really much more to look into it as far as I'm concerned. Now, there's some scholars that will go out there and they will say, well, no, it was grape juice. And they'll pull about every, every reference you can think of and they say, see, it was grape juice, all right? And I've seen, I've seen kind of both sides. I still think it was wine because, again, I'm a black and white kind of person. If the Bible says wine, I, I just take it to say wine, right? If you look in the, uh, the Greek, it, it says it's wine, all right, so it, that's up to you. If you think it's grape juice, that's fine. I don't. It doesn't really bother me. I don't care. But it would, like I said, it's a point of contention many times amongst Christians, and, and you just take it how you will. It's not something that's worth arguing over, unless you just want to have a friendly discussion. But if you want to argue about it, you know, go argue with somebody else. I, it, it says wine to me, right? So the Bible says wine. Uh, and in verse 4, another thing, oh, yeah, verse 4, it says, uh, Jesus said to her, Woman... What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, this is not a derogatory term. All right? this is, when we call somebody woman, sometimes in, in, in our society, it could be looked at as derogatory. Jesus, this is not a derogatory term here. But a lot of times, once, once boys became men, or once they started moving into adulthood, they didn't really call their mom's mother anymore. Right? It's kind of the same thing with my kids. Uh, 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 Roddy, he, he's getting to the age, he doesn't call us mommy or daddy anymore. He calls us mom or dad. It's kind of like this transition. It was kind of the same thing here. Once, once a guy was moving into manhood or adulthood, he didn't really call his mom mother or mommy anymore, right? He, he kind of had a different term for it. It was still a term of respect, right? So we don't get that confused. But it was just a different term, uh, uh, you know, to, to call his mom. So we see woman. It's not, it's not a bad thing. And then we, in verse 5 it says, His mother said to his servants, Whatever he says, you do it, right? Whatever he says to you, do it. And I think that's interesting because I don't know if Mary was actually thinking about what she was saying at this point, but there's a good point. We see, it, we see a problem. A problem came up, and then Mary says, hey, Jesus, there's no wine. And then she looks to her servants, and she says, do whatever he says. Right now, and now in the grand scheme of things, if we were out here in the fellowship hall and we ran out of Mountain Dew or, or soda or something, and then we look back at, at, at Charles and we're trying to help out, let's say, and, and, and Diane says, hey, do whatever Charles wants you to do. We'll get this stuff fixed. Right? That, that's kind of how we can look at it, right? and that makes sense. But on, on, an, on another scale, we can look at that, this and we can say whenever there's a problem, right? And we look to Jesus and we say, Jesus, what are we to do? And then we look out to give advice to others and we say, do whatever the Lord says. Right? The best point of advice that was ever given to me as a young preacher coming up was saying that whenever, whenever somebody has a problem, make sure your first, your first knee-jerk reaction is to make sure you ask them, are they looking to God to try to fix their problem? Are they, are they reading their Bible and are they praying? Because you can, you can give them all kinds of, of uh, advice, but the, the best advice you could give them is make sure that they're seeking the Lord first. Make sure that's the first place they're going. Now, if they still have some kind of confusion after that, then yes, of course, give them advice and, and try to help them along and you know, give maybe a step-by-step -step thing that they can try to follow. But always make sure first that they're seeking the Lord. Because for any Christian, your first reaction, whenever there's problem, we should do this anyway, regardless of there's problems or not. But, it, but whenever we have problems, our first inkling is to go to the Lord. That should be our first habit, our first reaction, our first <coughs> reflex. Let me ask the Lord what is going on here. Let me try to fix this problem. Let me pray about it. Right? Let me fa maybe if you, if you fast, try fasting and praying. Right? Try to get this stuff fixed with the Lord before we start trying to go out to other places and fix it. Right? Because that's, it's just a good, it's a good habit to get into. You know, go to God first. Go to God first and try to fix it. And, Jesus, and Mary points that out. She says, whatever he says to you, do it. And like I said, I don't know if she actually meant it, you know, to be an application later on, thousands of years later. Here we are talking about it, right? But either way, that's what she said. She said, uh, whatever Jesus says, do it. Verse 6 says, Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. Okay, now put yourself in the, in the shoes of the servants. What good did that do, Jesus? Goodness sake, you just told us to fill it up with water. Now we're taking it out. What, what kind of fix was that? That didn't fix any problem, did it? Nobody's going to be tricked and think that this water is any kind of wine. Many times when, we, when, when the Lord helps us fix situations, and he's going through and he's fixing it, and we're praying about it, and, and we say, Lord, that's not what I was praying for. Right? There's a story that goes back, and you've all probably heard this, this kind of story before, but there was a flood. Right? The flood, and his, 
Uh, this guy's house was getting flooded, and he didn't know what to do, so he had to crawl on top of his roof. So he started praying, Lord, get me out of here. Send a helicopter to come get me. Send a helicopter, otherwise I'm going to die. All right? And all of a sudden, you see a guy come by on a little rowboat. and saying, hey, man, get in. The waters are getting higher. Get off your roof. Get in the boat. He said, no, I prayed to the Lord to send me a helicopter, not a, not a boat. Right? And the guy in the rowboat keeps going, and, but that guy stays on his roof. He keeps praying for a helicopter. Before you know it, a jet ski comes along and a, and a, and a, and a motorboat. And he keeps telling people, no, I can't get in because I've been praying for a helicopter. God's going to send me a helicopter, right? Well, silly, you know, you, don't, you take the help that you can get. Sometimes when we're praying to the Lord, we might do the same thing. We might be praying for what seems most logical, right? We might, let's say our car breaks down. Let's just use this as an example. And the Lord does, and we, and we start praying, Lord, I need another car. I don't have another car. And then before you know it, you see a bicycle. For two, somebody threw a bicycle out on the side of the road. All right, there it is. The Lord's giving you a bicycle. And you don't, and you don't want it because, Lord, I'm praying for a car. Right? But sometimes you've got to look and see what the Lord has given you and just take it. Right? There's good to come from everything. There might be something else to it. There might be an extra blessing attached that you just don't know about. What if you skipped that bicycle and said, I don't want that bicycle. Right? I need a car. Right? Lo and behold, you didn't know that years before somebody had taken up you know, $500 or whatever and rolled it up and stuck inside the little basket of that bicycle and you just, you just passed it up. Right? The little kid down the street is going to get 500 bucks. You know, you just don't know sometimes. We have to look and see what the Lord does and accept it. Don't think we're too good for the, for the, the things that the Lord's going to do for us. If he gives you a solution, take it. Right? Trust that he's going to make it better or he's going to make it enough. Right? Trust that he's going to make it enough. But these servants here, Jesus says, fill the stuff up with water. And they're looking at it. Okay, water. What are we going to do with water? Right? We don't got no, there's no Kool-Aid packets we can stick in there and trick people. Right? You don't have that stuff back then. But he said, fill it up. And then, and then he said, draw, the, draw them. Uh, he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. Now, the one good thing we see here of the servants is they are doing exactly what Jesus said. So they take it to the master of the feast. This is like the party planner. All right. This is like the party planner. This guy knows how to plan a party. He knows what things are supposed to taste like. If he sees some cupcakes brought out, the, the cherries aren't just right. He's going to tell them to take them back. This is the master of the party. This is what he does. This is his job. So they take the wine to the master of the party. And when he took it, says, When the master of the feast tasted it, the water that was made into wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The servants knew. I don't know if they somehow knew if they were carrying that water out and they saw it from the time he dipped it out of the pots or if it turned to wine as they were carrying it out to the master. I don't know, but the servants knew something was up. They knew that they knew something, was, something had happened. But the master of the party didn't know. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Right. So the master of the party, he says, you know what? This is good wine. This is good stuff. This is not swill or whatever the terms are for the old, you know, nasty stuff you hear in movies sometimes. You know, what are y'all drinking? What, you know, whatever it is. But the master of the party knew that this was something good. This is not something you can just go out there and get. This was good wine, he says. And he's bragging about it. You've kept the good wine until now. And the reason he says you're supposed to bring out the good wine first, why? Because once people have had a couple, a couple glasses, all right, according to what he's saying, they don't care what really they're drinking after that. Okay? But he brought out the good wine. You've saved the good stuff till now. And he's happy about it. Right? He's, uh, we see an exclamation point. And he says that out there. Let's look at verse 11. It says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, his brothers and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. So this is we see kind of the culmination of the first miracle of Jesus. We think about all the things that Jesus ended up doing in his life on the earth, uh, healing the blind, curing leprosy, doing all these things, right? But it all started off with something simple, didn't it? It started with something simple. And this is not something I have in my notes, but it's something interesting to think about. Sometimes when we're trying to go out there and do something for the Lord, and you think, man, I've surrendered my life to the Lord. You know, the Lord's going to do something great. Sometimes it always doesn't start off with great big fireworks, you know, going off and just, man, everything's going good. Sometimes it starts off simple when the Lord starts to move. It kind of ramps up, which is, which is good for some people. And sometimes when things just blow up and things change, oh, man, I can't handle that, right? But sometimes things will start off, you know, kind of slow. And we start to wonder, wait, I thought, you know, we, we, we made all these changes and made this big old plan but the, we're not seeing the results that we thought we were going to see. You know what? Have patience. You know, that could be the advice. Jesus didn't start off greatly either. He didn't even start till he was 30 years old. Even his first miracle, 
in the, in, in the light of the other miracles that he did, were very minuscule compared to what he was going to do later. Right? So when we see, uh, if we're looking for results and you, you have this big old plan before the Lord and you were expecting it to take off like a rocket to, you know, to outer space, just, just be patient. The Lord might be just ramping it up little by little. Right? We've got to be patient with certain things. Jesus is a perfect example of that. He started off with a little small miracle, hardly, I don't say good for nothing because there's a point to find in it. But at the same time, in light, making water to wine, you know, what, what, what holds more weight, water to wine or curing leprosy? My goodness, curing leprosy, of course, right? But it started small. So we got to look at that. Let's look at verse 13. It says, Now the Passover of the, over of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now the Passover takes place in April. That's when it takes place. That's when uh, Jewish tradition has always said it takes place. It takes place in April. So how long after Jesus made the water and the wine? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but we do know that, that Jesus now is going up for the Passover. It's, it's about the... Uh, this year, they said Passover is between the 19th and the 27th, right? If you look on the cal their, their calendar this year, that's when they celebrate it this year. And Passover would last between six and eight days, depending on how the days fell and how the calendar fell. So Jesus is there. It's about April. Let's look at verse 14. It says, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured the changers money and over, uh, poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house, the zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now there's some things to look out here. Because, um, and this is an interesting thing. Uh, there was, you have to forgive me because I don't remember. There was a church up in one of the inner cities, right? Uh, and what they did one thing this ministry that this church did is an inner city church. Uh, you get a lot of inner city people there. They live basically on the streets, don't have nothing, right? A lot of drugs and things like that. But what this church did is they started up a coffee shop inside the church, right? And one, not only to help the church, you know, kind of keep going, but also what, what the other part of that ministry was, was to teach young people how to work, teach them how to carry a job. And what the pastor, as he ran that coffee shop, what he would do is he would train people how to work how to mop floors, how to get there on time, how to make a coffee, you know, providing them with certain skills. Well, lo and behold, of course, you have these other churches that are doing real good, and they kind of criticized it. They said, haven't you ever read the Bible? Didn't you know that you're not supposed to make your, your church a house of merchandise? You know, and they kind of condemned them for it, you know, which I think is kind of messed up. But he had a good ministry going there, and it, it was a good thing. Now, you can look at it that way, right? And if the Lord calls something for that, you know, I mean, we do fundraisers, you know, for goodness sake. Right? We, wanna, we, wanna, we do fundraisers to support other things. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. That's not what Jesus is driving these money changers out for. Right? So what is going on? What made Jesus so angry? We don't ever see Jesus raising his hand to anybody, but we do see it here uh, in the temple. So what happened? Right? So you, you do, some, do a little research, and you see what was going on here. Um, now there's two reasons what, uh, of what, why Jesus was angry. Right, because Passover was supposed to be a special time. Passover was supposed to be a time when people got together and they reflected on what of what what God had done for them. Kind of the same thing we do with the Lord's Supper. Right, when we get together for the Lord's Supper. It's a time of uh, to be sober. It's a time to remember. It's a time to be serious. It's not a time to uh, start a feast up, just like we was reading a couple weeks ago in Corinthians. It's not a time to make a feast and uh, cook a pig underground and and you know make all these kinds of fancy meals. That's not that's not what it's for. Right? The Lord's Supper is a time to be serious and remember what God did for us. Now, Passover is the same way. It wasn't to be a tourist attraction. It wasn't a time when everybody got together and partied, if you will. Now, it's not to say that that wouldn't happen, because sometimes families lived all over Israel, and this will be a, the only time of the year that they would really get together and, and see each other. Right? But what was going on here at the temple? The temple was a time you, you're supposed to be there serious. Everything's, you know, supposed, you bring your sacrifices. But it became a tourist attraction. People came to see it. They forgot about everything that it was supposed to be, and, they, and it would became a tourist attraction. All the vendors would bring out their, their finest goods, and that's when they would make the most money. It's kind of like we see sometimes in tourist towns. The tourist season is the best time for some of these towns. We went up to Maine a few years ago uh, to the coast up there and had a great time, but it was during the off-season. It was cheaper to travel that way, I can tell you, and there's not as much traffic. All right, so we went up during the off-season, Got a real nice hotel at a real low price, but the, the town was kind of dead. Some of the stores were closed, you know, so we didn't get to see everything. But, you know, it was a good time, a good little vacation we took there. 
But during the tourist season, guess what? Man, it's just it's busy. There's traffic everywhere. All the all the stores are open on the on the on the beach there. Boats are out everywhere. You know, it's the same kind of thing. During the Passover, what well, they were turning it into a big tourist attraction. There was not much to do with the temple until Passover. Now we got all the people selling their 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 nicest wares, if you will, around the temple because the temple was the attraction. Everybody showed up at the temple to give their sacrifices, and Jesus didn't like that. He said, "This is not what this time is for." This time is to reflect on something, that, that a blessing from the Lord that has happened before. So that's the first thing. The second reason that Jesus is mad, and this, this makes me angry just to think about it, but there would be families that would travel from far away, right? You can imagine, you'd have all kinds of people coming in, people with lots of money, people with no money, right? For some of those families, it was everything that they could do to spare a lamb for the sacrifice for their family. They would do their best. They, they would talk about that some people would even keep that lamb inside the house with them, just like it was one of their kids. They would keep it in just to make sure that it didn't get sick, that it didn't get any kind of injuries or anything like that. Because if it did, guess what? If that lamb got sick or if that lamb got uh, uh, any kind of injury or so, any kind of blemish whatsoever, now that lamb, according to the Levitical law, was no longer good for sacrifice. Man, what are we going to do now? Our, our sacrifice for this year is gone. What are we going to do? Right? So these families, they would, they would put so much time and effort to make sure their sacrifice stayed whole, if you will. Right? So you take this same family, and now they're traveling, and they're keeping this lamb well you know, for the sacrifice. They would go to the temple, and they would take it into the priest, and guess what the priest would say? The priest would look at it and say, there's no mark on this lamb. There's no special approval. There's no USDA sticker on here to say you can use, sell this. Right? It's kind of using an example. There's no, there's no approval on this lamb. And the priest, what he would do, he would turn them away. Right now, this family's got nothing. Now they can't do their sacrifice according to the law. But guess what the priest would say? They would say, "Hey, but get, just so you know, outside they've got some special lambs out there. They're marked. They've got the priestly mark on them. They've already been looked over by the priest. Right? They've been inspected. So you can go outside and buy one of those lambs, and then you, then we can get your sacrifice done. Then we can get the business done, and, and your sins will be forgiven for the next year." But guess what? They would go outside and buy, try to buy those lambs, and guess what? They were marked up like five hundred percent. Right? And the priests were getting a cut of it. The priests were getting a cut of this stuff. They, they would get their money. Also, the vendors would get their money. So they were making money off of the, off of the mercy and grace of God, if that makes sense. Does that make, kind of make sense what I'm talking about? What they were doing is, I mean, it's so far wrong, it's ridiculous. Right? Jesus meant for, for the sacrifice and meant for forgiveness to be something that was doable for everybody. It meant to be doable. But then you got these poor folk that were coming around. And what if they couldn't afford the lamb or the dove, the specially marked ones? What was going to happen to them? Now, now what? They couldn't have their sins forgiven according to the Levitical law? That's what made Jesus so angry. Man, he's, he's upset, right? These people are making money off of people that can't afford anything, right? These priests and all this stuff. It's completely corrupt. And that's why Jesus is angry. So he gets a whip, right? Gets a whip and he starts driving these people out. The Son of God. Man, he's, he's upset. He's hot. He's angry. Get out of here. You're destroying the whole purpose of what everybody's trying to do here. Right? Jesus was angry. So that's what we see. Uh, that's why Jesus did this. That's why he was angry. That's why he was upset. They've completely destroyed, if you will, what, what the purpose of the sacrifice was. And some people, you know, God forbid, I don't know if it happened, but hopefully, you know, nobody got turned away because they couldn't afford anything, you know. But, that, but the laws were very strict. The priests were very corrupt, right? The lamb had to be without blemish, and they just took advantage of that. Let's look at verse 18. It says, So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up again in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. You know, this is an interesting thing. that Jesus gives a prophetic saying here. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'm going to raise it up. And he was talking about himself, right? In three days, we, we know that Jesus was uh, crucified, and three days later he rose from the grave. But he told him this lesson how many years before? About three years before it actually happened. You know, there's things that you're going to hear today. There's things that you're going to hear tomorrow. Uh, there's things that you're going to hear maybe last week or two weeks ago that you, they might not make any sense to you until, until a couple years from now, just like we see this. Sometimes we might go to church and say, man, I heard that sermon. I've heard it a million times. You know, what a waste. All right? That can apply to anybody. I've said the same thing before in years past. Man, I felt like I got nothing out of it. All right? But the, when Jesus gave this lesson here, even his disciples were saying, hey, 
I don't even under, they didn't even know what the meaning of it was until three years later when Jesus rose from the dead. And then they remembered. They looked back and they said, oh yeah, I remember Jesus saying that. Right? And that's one of the things that helped solidify their belief in the scriptures. Right? That was one of the things that helped secure their foundation, if you will. It's the same thing with us today. There might be times, you might be going through a dry season when it feels like you're reading your Bible and you're not getting anything out of it. You know, Lord, why am I reading my Bible? Why am I praying? I don't feel any better. I don't feel like I'm getting anything from it. You know, that's where the perseverance of the saints kicks in. That's where perseverance and just putting your head down and put one foot in front of the other, that's where that kicks in. Keep on doing it. Keep on plowing the ground. Keep taking steps forward because it's going to pay off. It's going to pay off at some point. It might not seem like it's paying off today, but there's going to be a point in time when it's going to pay off. The, book, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that the God's word, whenever it goes out, it does not return void. There's always a reason that his word goes out. There's never a time you could go out here and, and just for kicks, right? Just for kicks. And you can try this. Go and try it. Or go in the grocery store. I don't care where you do it. Go somewhere and recite a, a small verse from the Bible. I don't care if it's the smallest verse in the Bible. What's the smallest verse? Uh, Jesus wept. That John eleven thirty five. 35. I always remember that when I was a kid. All right, a little trivia. Now, Jesus wept. Smallest verse in the Bible. That promise that God's word does not return void applies to every single, every single period, comma, word in the Bible. His, his word does not return void. There's always some good that's going to come out of it. Right? And that's why it's always good to memorize scripture. You don't have to be like these real smart guys, these great scholars that like to memorize books of the Bible at a time. I tried that before. I, I couldn't do it. All right? I got through about two chapters and it stressed my brain out so bad I couldn't do it anymore. It's like, man, I don't know how they do it. And I had two chapters of the Bible, I got through it, and it's like, man, my, my head hurt every day. I couldn't, couldn't keep it up. But you know, that's why it's good to memorize scriptures. Have verses in the Bible that are going to be kind of like your foundation verses. Things that you look back on that help, they're like a rudder for your life. They're like an anchor to you. Right? Everybody usually, many times people have verses that are different from them one from another. Dwayne's anchor life verses might be different than mine, and, and Marshall's, and Donna's, and, and, and Carol's. They might be all different. But there's something that when times get bad, you can look back on that verse to help solidify you. Man, get your mind right. Get, your, get yourself straight. You know, kind of like a, a, a slap to the back of the head, if you will. You know, boom, hey, you know, get yourself right. Think about what you're doing. You know, get your mind right. You know, those verses that are going to help you keep on track and things like that. But Jesus said this several years before and not till, a couple, not till about three years later that it finally dawned on the disciples. Oh, yeah, I remember he taught us that. I remember that, you know, and, and it was a prophetic saying. Now, verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, and when they saw the signs, uh, when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew all men, and had no need that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, what, is the, what does the Bible say in there? The Bible says he didn't commit himself to them. Why? Because what was attracting the people to him at this point? All the miracles. What would happen when Jesus stopped the miracles? You think they would stick around? No, we see Jesus at the very end. Even, even his closest disciples, they, they ran. They dispersed. They weren't even with him during his hardest time uh, when he was being arrested and taken to the cross. The Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all, they all took off. They all ran away. They all betrayed him at, at some level or another. They couldn't stick by his side. Jesus was by himself. And Jesus looked at these people and he, said, he looked at them and he said, You know what? They're only here for the miracles. Right? They, might, they might say they believe now, but they're only here for the miracles. I heard a very wise preacher say one time, he said, you know what? If you use carnal means to get people to church, you're going to have to use carnal means to keep them there. And I thought that was a very, very interesting thing. And what he was pointing out is he said, sometimes uh, people will look up and they'll read books. He said, they'll read books and they'll look at a formula that worked before. And he said, hey, that church over there has, has 500 people in it. Let me go ask and see what they do. And that preacher of that church might say, he says, you know what? Every Easter, I, and I've heard a church doing this, right? And it's the, I, I believe he was doing the right thing. But every Easter, we're going to have a zoo at the church, right? We're going to have lions and tigers and bears, seriously. And we're going to have camel rides and we're going to have donkeys. And, and that's what we're going to do. And then the other church sees that and said, man, we should probably do the same thing, right? We should, we should try to do that. Let's, let's get our lions and bears and, and stuff like that. But that preacher that, that, that went for advice, maybe that's not his gifting, right? Or that church. Maybe that's not their gifting to put on a circus, Right? And do those kinds of things. So for them, guess what? For this other church where their gifting is to put on some great circus and, and big old, 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 big old uh, uh, attraction, man, their people, their, that church over there might be gifted in that. They might be having the greatest time ever serving the Lord, that working together and just having a great old time. They might be able to do that almost every week and never get tired of it. 
But this other church trying to copy what they're doing, that might be hard work for them because that's not their gifting. They might try to go over there and copy it, and man, it's wearing them down. And they're looking, Lord's not giving results, and uh, oh, I'm getting discouraged. I'm just going to leave church. Man, they've just burnt themselves out doing something that the Lord didn't want them to do. Right? They were trying to, in, within their own means, to get people there. So Jesus looks at these people and said, you know what? They're just here for this reason. I'm not going to commit myself to them. All right? I'm not going to commit myself to them because they're just here for the, the fireworks. All right? We have to be very careful now in today's day and age, and uh, especially with, with the things that we do. We, we don't do things to please people. We cannot do things to please people because guess what? Then guess, you know how hard it is to please people? There's this, um, there's this uh, psychologist talk about this disorder that many actors, people that have been acting their entire life, they have this disorder where they talk about, they said that they've gone through their whole life uh, trying to please people so much that they don't know how to be themselves. They get later in life and they've got these complexes and, and these mental problems because they don't know how to be who they were meant to be. Because if you ever go out there to Hollywood, uh, you're going to find out that every day is an audition. Every day is an audition. They're trying to get these parts and they're trying to make a living. And you might think, man, acting would be fun. And I think some people are called to that, so don't get me wrong. But there are some people that go out there, they'll spend their whole life. Anytime they go to the store, they've got to be dressed a certain way to try to, to try to portray a certain look, right? Because they might run into a certain director or somebody that's doing the casting and say, hey, that's the kind of look we need. Let's get them. So they put on this face every single day. They have to do their makeup a certain way. And they're not doing it because it makes them happy. They're trying to please others. And it wears them out. It wears them out. And it makes them depressed. And we, they get into drugs and they do all this stuff because guess what? They've, they've robbed themselves of joy because they, they're trying to please others. Here in church, one thing we have to always take first is we minister to those that God has given us first. That's always the first step. Whoever we see here uh, in church, whoever's a part of our body, that's who our responsibility is every time. No, I'm not, I'm not excluding family. If you've got a family, of course, that's your priority. But inside the church, the people that we're most concerned about primarily are those that come here to, to, to serve one, with one another. Those that are here for each other, those that come here, right? Everybody else is secondary. I've had questions before asking me, why don't you, why don't you do, and this, this, this comes from an evangelistic mind. There are some preachers that are called to be evangelists, and they, they're out everywhere. They travel all over the place, and they preach all over the place, and, and that's their priority, right? Their sermons are almost always uh, uh, about salvation, but that's how God's called them to be, right? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, go off and do what they want. You know, that's what God's called them to be. But there are other preachers that are called to be, to, called to be pastors. We see this in the, in, the, in the New Testament. You know what? Your priority is going to be to the people that are there in front of you. That's how it's got to be. My priority is not to... Whoever out there, you know, that I, that I might see once a month. You know, our priority is, is to our people here and whoever God brings in. And the Bible says if we're faithful over a little, guess what? If you're faithful over little, then, you can, then it shows that you can be faithful over much. You got to be careful. In the military, they used to tell us that you got to train as you fight, right? We used to make these arguments as, as, as immature, inexperienced privates in the military. We used to say, man, I don't want to fire blanks. I want to fire real bullets. Right? Forget this blank stuff. We've been training on blanks now this week for like 50 hours. I'm tired of this stuff. And we'd have to go. They'd make us clear these rooms. And, and there was nothing in the room. They'd make us, uh, they'd have these different rooms. One had a door, a door in the corner. And when, whenever the team, the fire team would go in, they'd have to clear that room a certain way. But if the door came in the center of a wall, kind of like this one, you had to change your tactics. And many times when you go in that room, you didn't realize how it was set up until you got in there. And you had to adjust on the fly. Right. And we had to do that over and over. And oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's like a nightmare. Looking back on that. We went over and we'd spend a week at the shoot house. And that's all we would do before we even got into shooting blank. We would clear that same room thousands of times, hours on hours, just doing it over and over. And we used to be so frustrated because you'd get back after that week and say, man, what good was that training that week? We didn't get to shoot any bullets. What? We didn't even get to shoot blanks. The next time we went out, you know, for two weeks, we'd run through that shoot house for two weeks, shooting blanks. Nothing in there, just empty rooms. Shooting blanks, right? And then finally, you know, at the culmination of our training, we'd spend two or three days shooting up all the ammo you could imagine. Man, that was a good time. Then they'd start putting targets in the room, and they'd do all that kind of stuff. But there had, something had to lead up to it, didn't it? Something had to lead up to it. So my point is, you know, sometimes when we, when we get through, sometimes, man, sometimes, sometimes stuff seems mundane. But you got to do what's put in front of you. you got to deal with the things that are put in front of you. Oh, we don't have blanks. Man, what, what, this is horrible. I want to get to the part where there's bullets flying. Man, that's always fun, right? If you can be faithful and you can train as you fight and you can be faithful over making sure you're not flagging your buddies with the barrel of your rifle with, when you got nothing in it, guess what? Okay, we can give you live bullets now because we've seen you for hours and hours and hours 
you know, in, in weeks almost, to where you've been safe. Every single time you've gone in that room, you've been safe, right? We're not scared about you being two or three feet away from your buddy and accidentally shooting them, right? Because now you've developed that. It's the same thing. Sometimes we look out, and, and I, my dad is a, a good example of this. When he was called to, uh, to, to uh, the church up there, there was only just a few people, right? And he would get discouraged. Man, I've been here a year, and we still only got like 12 people in this church. It's a big old building, right? It's a big building. And we still only got like 12 people. And dad, my dad would say he's getting discouraged a little bit. And I tried this. The roles reversed. And I tried to encourage him. Man, just be faithful. If you're faithful over a little bit, you know, God says he'll make you. He's, if you can show you're faithful over a little and you, you pour your heart into these people, guess what? You know, there's more right around the corner. You know, now they're running, you know, 30, 40 people, you know, several years later. But, that, but that's the thing. You be faithful over what God has given you, right? And show that, hey, we can manage this because you, know, you want to get too big for your britches, right? We can manage this, right? And I'm speaking to the, the deacons and the, the, the uh, musicians and all the leaders of the church. Man, show that, we can be, show that we can take what we have, and man, we can make much of it. We can, Lord, we got this, right? We can love all these people. We can be in an encouragement. We can keep everything straight. And then guess what? If we can show the Lord we're faithful over a little bit, then he's going to call us to more. And what the pace of that will be, I don't know. Will God ever bring more? I don't know. I don't know God's mind. I do know that my priority and our priority as leaders is to be faithful with who God has given us. We love these people as much as we can. That's, that's, that's how you got to do it. Then we continue on. Let God worry about all the other stuff. The Bible says God gives the increase. Let him worry about the increase. All right? That's John chapter 2. All right? And there's lots of stuff you can pull out of it. And there's lots of neat lessons there. But if I could tell you to all to remember anything today. You know, next week we're going to be in John chapter 3. But if I could say, you know, the best way we can do this, love people, treat them. Um, oh, I, I, was getting, <laughs> I was getting what I was talking to the teens the other day. I was getting that confused with today. Uh, but if we could remember anything. You know, just remember that sometimes, you know, just pick, pick and choose. But if we could remember anything today, just remember, love people. Be faithful with who God's given you. You got, a, you got a family, be faithful to them. Just, man, love them as much as you can, right? Don't look for results. Don't look for results uh, as, as a, a product of what you're doing, right? Look at results as a product of what God has done for you, man. It's, if you get that in your mind, man, it's so much easier to deal with things in life, right? I'll go ahead and call the musicians forward. Next week, we're going to be in John chapter 3. If you want to read ahead... Uh, go ahead, it's to your benefit, right? Because God's word doesn't return void. It always goes out for a purpose. But if God's speaking to your heart today about anything, we, uh, we have an invitation here. You know, come for, if you need to come forward for prayer or anything like that, come on forward. Uh, we'll pray for you. Uh, if not, the invitation is always open. The door over at the parsonage is open. Uh, if you don't want to come talk to me, we got, <laughs> I don't want to point Horace out anymore. I've been using him a lot these past couple weeks. But we got Horace, we got all the deacons. We're all more than willing to talk to you and encourage you. Uh, pray for you, whatever it might be, all right? Let's go ahead and stand as we conclude the service.